That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Big George Foreman, the miraculous story of the once and future heavyweight champion of the world, which is the ninth film directed by George Tillman Jr., which Sony Columbia Pictures is releasing on April 28th, 2023. For anyone expecting the Arthurian style legend that the title implies, uh, this is more along the lines of a church pamphlet you'd receive in the supermarket parking lot. Oh, the director, do you know his other films? Yes, and so do you. George Tillman Jr. is, I actually consider to be quite a solid film director. His sophomore film was Soul Food in 1997 oh. with Vanessa L. Williams, which is a good film. Um, he also did The Notorious, uh, he did Notorious, which is the Biggie Smalls biopic, which we saw together way back when that came out, which I didn't love. Uh, but I think The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete with J. Hud is also worth a watch, as is 2018's The Hate You Give. I thought this movie was pretty bad. I was a little shocked. Again, going into a PG... Because none of, none of us live PG-13 lives. Uh, and this is a PG-13 biopic. And if somebody needed to throw a textbook at you to say, give me... Uh, the, the textbook biopic, all the beats, all the things that you could consider happening. It This film does that. But almost on a television level. Well, it's the life and boxing career of George Foreman. It's very basic. It's him joining the Job Corps as a teenager and getting plucked by Forrest Whitaker's character, uh, to who is a previous like a, he used to be a pro boxer, but now he works with the Job Corps. But he sees that George Foreman might be heading down the wrong path because of his rage. So he says, "You know, I can teach you how to box." He does. Within a year, he wins gold medal at the 68 Olympics, goes pro, wins a heavyweight title, and then loses it and takes a long break. And during that period, he becomes a preacher. Mm -hmm. But his funds are mismanaged and he ends up broke. So he realizes that he needs to go back to boxing to make money to get his life back on track. He does, and he ends up becoming the oldest heavyweight champ at the age of 45, the mm -hmm. end. That's yep. basically it. That's basically it. We really gloss over what he's might, he might be best remembered for, for those outside of the boxing world, which is his George Foreman grill. So, like, who would watch this movie? People who knew who George Foreman is. And I feel like anyone who knows who he is knows that he used to be the heavyweight champ, and then after a long hiatus, came back to become the oldest champ. So we all know that. We know that he, you know, the George Foreman grill, everyone had one. And that he has a bunch of sons named George. And there was a, a very notable commercial where they all got on TV and he said, George, 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 and George. And this movie, ugh. Straight out the gate, I feel like it would have been better if we would have started the film with George on the pulpit preaching. And then the first hour of the film is him doing that. And we find out that his finances were mismanaged. And what drove him to think that he needs to start boxing again. Because in this film, they make it seem like one of his parishioners, her grandson is getting into trouble. So she asks George, preacher George, could you show my son how to box? I think it'll help him get out of trouble. And George says no. And the kid doesn't want George to do it either. And then we see a few days later, the kid gets arrested for some hood rat stuff. So... George goes, well, I was too full of God, which I thought was such a weird line. I don't know what that he means. He said he was too full of himself being full of God. I believe that was the line. That's the line. So then he decides to purchase a gym to teach boxing. Uh, it's, he makes it a youth center. And then one day at the youth center, the electricity goes out. And that's when he finds out he doesn't have any money, that his business manager played by john mcgarrow who was a kid he met at the job corps like made some poor invest in investments risky investments and we kind of just leave it at that like the guy vanishes and we don't hear from him again well he gets choked out in the bathroom and then we don't hear from him again but it's like the movie should have started with him as a preacher the first hour of this film with because george's life the way the movie tells it is pretty boring he comes from a large family single mother seems like everything i mean they were poor but they seemed happy they they really play up the fact that he never had enough food to eat but i thought that was weird because the kid playing him 
is obese. I mean, he's ov- extremely overweight. The, the, so, the child playing him is, the, is overweight, which just seems funny <laughs> considering we're, we're having more than one scene showing that he isn't able to get enough food. So it, I, I didn't get a sense of like, this guy had that rough of a childhood. It's just that someone saw that he had potential as a boxer. He boxed. He did really well. He won the championship. So another fatal flaw of this film besides... Well, I didn't even say all the flaws. I think it's boring. It's the prop- screenplay is super basic. It's propaganda. Mm-hmm. The acting from several many people, I think is... Well, it's hard. <laughs> I think Chris Davis, who's playing Foreman from the age of, what, 18 to 45, is does a fine enough job. He's fine. Um, but the actor playing his mom, his first wife, Sonia his Stone. second wife, uh, like... The His second wife in particular. Jasmine Matthews playing Mary Joan, who's in The Tomorrow War, which is also not a, a good check mark on your resume, but uh, that accent she's doing is pretty bad. Again, though, the screenplay that uh, Tillman co-wrote with Frank Baldwin, who wrote The Cold Pursuit, which is a remake, um, is really bad. It, it glosses over so much and, and is trying... I know they're trying to honor his religious beliefs, but it just comes across as so stupid. Hokey. It's, it, it, it just seems stupid. Like, the reality of the situation is, you don't have any money. Why are you couching it in the fact that God gave me a vision that you want? Well, his wife says... Well, and even that seems weird because it appears that she has a nightmare. <laughs> and she's up all night and George goes to see her, like, sitting at the kitchen table... And, and she says, I had a vision from God that you're going to win the championship and use that platform to spread his word. So why did they make it seem like a nightmare? Mm-hmm. That was so weird. But I was getting to the biggest flaw of this film for me, besides all those things, is that there's a supporting character in this film named Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and that actor and the character of Muhammad Ali is like exponentially more dynamic and interesting than George Foreman. So the minute we meet Muhammad Ali and that actor playing him, I was like, I wish the movie could be about him because and this that, George Foreman guy's boring. And that actor playing him is Sullivan Jones, uh, who we uh, previously reviewed an excellent indie film called The Surrogate in 2020. Well, he's the best part of this film by far. Yes, and I don't know, Michael Mann's Ali with Will Smith from 2001, uh, the, uh, the denouement of that film is the rumble in the jungle, the the seventy four fight in Zaire between Foreman and Ali. I think they make Ali seem like a, or they make Foreman seem like a dumb version of Forrest Gump. <laughs> they make him. They, it's it, it. What's that thing in Zoolander? That, you know, that school for kids who can't read good, and because uh, he it's, he's filming that barbecue commercial, and it the the film takes pains to show somebody correcting his grammar and but then but uh, to what end or why I, I don't know there's a scene when george apparently died for a minute and it's like after a fight and then they revive they, they don't even revive him he just wakes up and they make it seem like it's a divine intervention that wakes him up and then he wants to run to the showers and they're like no because the cold water will make him go into shock and that scene was laughable it's laughable. They're trying to hold him back it's laughable because there's also not a medical professional uh there it's just forrest whitaker as doc and a couple other men being like we thought you died then him getting the cold shower turns into him being baptized and it's important be- to, to know that prior to that George Foreman is very anti-religion. He doesn't want to pray. Every time his mom talks about religion, he kind of scoffs at her. So now he's getting baptized. And that's when we go to him wanting to become a preacher. And the scene where he tells Forrest Whitaker that he doesn't want to fight anymore. He wants to be a preacher. I thought that was laughable. That was laughable. Forrest is like, how are you going to pay for your kids? And he's like, I'm going to follow God. But another part of his uh, his, his born-again status is um, his sister is having a difficult childbirth and the family rushes to the hospital and George is like get her, get her the best doctors I'll pay for it and the mother's like she already has the best doctors and he says a little prayer and the sister Mary knows he says a prayer and the baby lives and she's like it must have been you talking to God so I'm going to name this kid George I think if they wanted this movie if they wanted to focus on his like sort of side career as a preacher then the movie should have been about that because the way they make it here it just feels very made for tv like very quick jumps 
And then he leaves religion so quickly. Like, when he decides to go back to boxing, it's like, like, aren't you a preacher man? What happened? The film, and I don't know if it's intentionally, it showcases a George Foreman that every time that he's challenged or is not good at something, he abandons it. That's what this film is showing, like, on more than one occasion in several ways. I didn't think the fight choreography was well done. When he's at the 68 Olympics, that's the first time you see him fighting, like, like in a real ring. I thought that was really unremarkable. Every other fight was unremarkable. And then we do something weird because we see, like, maybe, like, six different fights. But the Foreman-Holyfield fight, they actually show, like, real footage. That seemed odd. They show real footage and they transpose uh, Chris Davis's face. Right, but they didn't do that with any other fight. I don't. I mean, maybe because they didn't have footage to use prior to. I don't know. Foreman was an executive producer, so I don't know how much leverage or or what demands were put upon this. This just felt real slap shot. There's a scene where so after the '91 fight with Holyfield, that's when Foreman gets his first big check. So now he's not broke anymore. And when he walks into the bank, every employee in the bank is standing like in the wherever, clapping for him. It's like a scene out of a movie where somebody's having a psychotic break and they're hallucinating about everybody doing that. That that is how this is staged. Then his new... So when he decides to come back to fighting, he employs the help of his previous coach, Forrest Whitaker, and at that point, he's George Foreman's like 41 or something, and he's like 320 pounds. So Forrest Whitaker says, you need to get down to 265, and then we'll talk. So then we get a weight loss montage, the tone of which is like kind of comedic. I thought that was a really poor decision. Then when he loses the weight and starts training, then we get a training montage, which was pointless because all it shows is that he can't fight the way he used to. So it ends with Forrest Whitaker saying, you need a new trick. But we don't know what that trick is. And then he goes to his fight and we realize that he... Well, first with Evander Holyfield. He loses. Mm -hmm. And then with the guy Moore, who he beats to win the championship at the age of 45, he chooses to wear him out, kind of like how Ali did back in the day. But the film kind of downplays that. Like, we never really learn what the trick is. (laughs) Just like that. So it's really ineffective as a procedural on how this man came back to be the oldest heavyweight champion in history. Mm-hmm. So it just fails on so many levels. Um, like, it fails in representing his religious beliefs in a way that's not laughable. Well, like, and, <laughs> and also his obviously, his obvious, I think, lack of passion for boxing, which uh, the film does also mishandles its thought process on how it's a traumatic, it's a traumatic sport. Like, on the body and mind. Yeah, I think it downplays... I mean, I, I, don't, I didn't get the sense that he enjoyed fighting. He likes money. Then, again, PG-13, his first wife... His first wife... It shows him having an affair with a woman that wheedles her way into his bedroom, so it almost makes well, him... But you can't even say we see, like, an affair. We, we don't see anything. It's implied <laughs> that he sleeps with this woman, but she went out of her way and very aggressively courted him. And then all of a sudden it's... But even that makes it sound more interesting than it was. It <laughs> is. And then it's implied that it, there's been more than one and these, these hoes are calling the house and his wife... Gets he, mad and divorces him. But he's also kind of iced her out like he won't even like kiss her. And it's like, okay. That was so ineffective. It's, but it's, it was just such lazy writing. I'm tired of talking poorly about this movie. What would you give it? We don't want to talk about when he throws himself into a pile of of feces to elude the police it just like like they they were really grasping for things to show that his youth was troubled but Mm -hmm. they really don't do a good job he seems like a normal kid from like you know meager beginnings Mm -hmm. well very very, from what this shows very meager but you know coming on all we see is his mom splitting one hamburger between like four or five people and this big boy talking about how hungry is his his poor little sister gives him gives, some, him gives him her piece of burger. <laughs> uh, coming on the heel, I didn't love Creed three, but Creed three had a lot of interesting things going for it, and a really I thought good performance from Jonathan Majors. And well, in the fight, I only I've only seen Creed three, and the fighting was very impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, or the Tyson series on Hulu, the Mike series. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, oh Mike, yeah, the you know. 
the beauty of that series was the actor playing Tyson and, and, and Mike Tyson as in a personality is very like dynamic and flawed. So it was very interesting. There's a lot to sink your teeth into. And it was, but it was being realistic also. And realistic. Like th this is a very polished, highly sanitized version uh, of a man and, the, and why he made the choices he did. Like propaganda. We need to finish this. What would you give this movie? You know, one and a half. I would give it two out of five. I think it's bad. I didn't enjoy it's it. It's Tillman Jr.'s worst film since Men of Honor. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>